The topic of today's video is language analysis for the relatively new Pearson 2.0 specification from Pearson. Uh, this is going to be aimed at paper one question three and I'm going to be using Charlotte Bronte's non-fiction extract all about the Great Exhibition uh, from the 1800s in Crystal Palace in London. You can see an image there of what it looked like. So we're going to start with this video at looking at what language analysis is or reminding ourselves what language analysis is. So pretty much all GCSE courses, whether that be Lit or Lang, but also A-level English, requires students to be able to think about how meaning is created. And of course, when you're dealing with writing, the language is going to be the main way that writers will create that meaning. So our responsibility as people that comment on uh, why a, a writer might use particular language is to be able to zoom in and be able to think about the effects of that language choice. So we are aware that language is an emotive tool, it can help us feel things, and we also need to appreciate that writing is a craft um, and therefore there is some conscious decisions that are made. So writers will choose some of their words deliberately because they are aware of the effect that they want to create. If possible, even though this question is not about feature spotting, and that's the same across all GCSE specs, um, it's not about just simply labelling terms, uh, but if you do know the terminology, that can help. But one of the things that I always say with language terminology is that it's like the icing on the cake. The main cake, so to speak, is the effects, it's the comments in your own words of why you think the writer has chosen that word in terms of the impact on the reader. So it's not about feature spotting. Because this is a reading task, students should also judiciously and carefully select short pieces of evidence, as in references or quotes, um, to link, I suppose, the extract to their analysis. And three sentence stems or three words that often help students in terms of giving an effect are the words think, feel or imagine. Uh, because when you're answering those kind of words, you are thinking about the effects of language choice. So that is what language analysis is. And it's the same across all GCSE specifications, regardless of the exam board that you are using. So for Pearson 2.0, um, this is what paper one question three will look like and as you can see I've colour coded this question, this task around the outside so we can break it down. You know, regular viewers of my channel will know that I do like breaking things down and seeing how it all kind of works together. Um, if we just start with the bottom, we've got to look at the whole text, we've got to use terminology if we know it, um, rather than just feature spot though. And we've also got to make references in blue there to the text itself. So that should be relatively straightforward. That shouldn't come um, at you as a surprise. The green shouldn't come as at you as a surprise either. Uh, we know that when we have a language analysis task, the analysis word there means we've got to write about the effect or the impact. So that's where we have TFI, think, feel, imagine. You are the reader. What is the effect on you? What did it make you think, feel or imagine? And also on the right hand side there, I've put a selection of what I call analysis words, conveys, reinforces, shows, etc, which are always useful, I think, for students to use in an analysis question, because it, it bridges this gap between the device itself and the effect, like this cause and effect idea. But potentially, and arguably, the most important phrase in this whole question is the yellow. Um, Pearson will like to use words like interest, inform and engage in their language questions. So in this case, they've used interest and inform. Um, what the examiner is essentially saying is the writer has written this text in a way that's engaging for readers. Um, what have they written that is engaging? What is it about what the writer has said which makes it interesting to read? Um, in this case, the way the extract has been written might make the reader want to go to this exhibition. Um, how is it uh, informing us? What is it informing us about? What is the topic of this extract? So interest and inform are quite broad general terms, 
but that can sometimes be useful um, because you can essentially um, make a decision for yourself what is the um, interesting thing or the engaging thing about what we're being told okay so that is the question so the extract like I said at the beginning is written by uh, Charlotte Bronte Charlotte Bronte is best known for writing the Victorian novel Jane Eyre uh, which is one of the pinnacle novels of the Victorian era in English literature she is part of a of a trio of three sisters, Emily, Anne as well, who all became very well known and very famous writers in their day. Uh, tragic though, they all died when they were relatively young um, because the water supply of the village where they lived in Yorkshire was poisoned by the nearby graveyard and um, they all died, I think, of tuberculosis, which in, in those days was called consumption. Their father actually had six children and the tragedy is that they all died before the father. Uh, so very bleak um, and a tragedy for people like me, like readers, because you wonder if these writers live longer, how many more wonderful novels would we have? Um, it's always a tragedy, it seems, that a lot of writers die young. But anyway, so in her lifetime, Charlotte Bronte visited Crystal Palace, where this great exhibition was taking place. And the great exhibition was essentially a place where exhibitors um, brought lots of kind of scientific and engineering um, kind of exhibits to be looked at, not just perhaps from the UK, but from all over the world. So it was a really big tourist attraction, very popular at the time. And you can see in that picture there the amount of crowds that went to this exhibition, Charlotte being one of those people that you can see in that image. So this is what she says. Yesterday I went for the second time to the Crystal Palace. It is a wonderful place, vast, strange, new and impossible to describe. Its grandeur does not consist in one thing, but in the unique assemblage of all things. Whatever human industry has created, you find there, from the great compartments filled with railway engines and boilers, with mill machinery in full work, with splendid carriages of all kinds, with harness of every description, to the glass-covered and velvet-spread stands loaded with the most gorgeous work of the goldsmith and silversmith, and the carefully guarded caskets full of real diamonds and pearls worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. It seems as if magic only could have gathered this mass of wealth from all the ends of the earth, as if none but supernatural hands could have arranged it thus, with such glaze and contrast of colours and marvellous power of effect. The multitude filling the great aisles seems ruled and subdued by some invisible influence. Amongst the 30,000 souls that people it that day, I was there. Not one loud noise was to be heard, not one irregular movement seen. The living tide rolls on quietly with a deep hum like the sea heard from the distance. So very descriptive. Uh, she's aware, of course, that the reader might not be there. So she's got to use her language to create a, an evocative sense of place. And you could argue that by listing all of this stuff that she sees at this exhibition, that is what happens. In that second paragraph, she's essentially saying that the exhibition was so interesting and so engaging to the thousands of people that went that they were stunned into silence um, because they had never seen anything like it before. Uh, so they are uh, moving through this exhibition very quietly because of, they are just awestruck by what they can see. So you can pause this video now and think about what words from this um, extract you would like to talk about. Um, the three is the magic number. So I would be asking my students to talk about three examples of language. So three words or three phrases or a mix of both. So there might be more than that. Um, but obviously in, with an eight mark question, there's going to be a limit about what you can write because of the time. It's about eight to ten minutes long, this question. So you're not going to be able to write an essay. So you have to be very selective. So at this point in the exam, you would take your highlighter and you would find your evidence. And this could be the evidence that you pick a lot more here than you need. And for the purpose of this video, I'm going to be just zooming into three of these um, and kind of developing the points really with the idea that the student would then uh, write those points in their response. We've got a mixture here of adjectives, a mixture here of devices like lists um, and similes, some of which I haven't highlighted. But there's a lot here. 
And for language as well, you can also talk about statistics so, or numbers, 30,000. That's also sometimes called a quantifier um, because it quantifies an amount. So numbers in language are often called quantifiers. So I'm going to talk about three of these um, and think about developing our ideas. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a list. Uh, mill machinery, splendid carriages, diamonds and pearls. The Bronte, the writer, is literally just listing uh, things that she can see. And the effect of that in the kind of the circle on the, or the oval on the left hand side is really the effect. She's listing things because she is effectively also a bit overwhelmed by the amount that is at this exhibition. Large variety of stuff to see, keeping people interested and engaged, fascinating and or, or inspiring and valuable. So that is the effect. That is why she's listing. Uh, so she has deliberately decided to list in her writing. Second is the metaphor where she talks about a blaze and contrast of colours. A blaze, of course, referring here to a fire and a fire, uh, flames of a fire can be very colourful, deep oranges and reds and sometimes blues and greens as well. So it helps readers visualise what she can see. She is aware that the reader is not there. So she's got to use her language to try and recreate this vivid, colourful location. Um, so she's looking at all of the exhibits and she's saying it's quite vibrant because of all the different artefacts, many of which might be exotic and from abroad. Um, she is kind of overwhelmed and struck by how colourful and how appealing the, um, the exhibition um, is. And finally, you could talk about the statistic, 30,000 souls. And again, if we ask ourselves the question, well, why is she using that statistic? It's because she wants to let us know that this is a very popular uh, place to visit at this time. Um, and the, it's basically crammed with the public, probably of all ages. And the public, despite the very large crowds, are all wowed so much by this exhibition that they are stunned into silence. They cannot believe what they're seeing. Um, so she's also telling us about the reaction of the crowd as well. And that might also be engaging and informing and interesting for us to, um, as a reader, because we're not there. This is, you know, 200 years ago, but the language makes it seem like, oh, we want to go there too, because it seems a little bit interesting, okay, or a lot interesting. Um, so that is uh, examples of how we zoom in using these kind of circular diagrams in order to think about developing our knowledge of the effects of this language. So the video is going to finish by giving you three examples of a sample answer, uh, low, mid and high, with some annotations that the examiner might write on your paper if they were marking this paragraph in a, in a, a proper exam. So this is very short, as you can see, but also the way in which the evidence has been used has not been very effective. The quote arguably is too long here um, and it wastes time. But the quote is also not embedded, which means that it doesn't flow in the answer. They've kind of put it in its own sentence. And the response finishes um, quite abruptly. Uh, the student says this emphasises that the great exhibition is impossible to describe. More detail is needed there. For example, why is it impossible to describe? Um, I would argue she actually is describing it quite well. Um, so clearly uh, there is a degree of, of a lack of confidence here in looking at the language choice. There's also no terminology either, but I do like the fact they've used the word emphasises, which is good. Um, one of those analysis words. A mid-level answer uh, would obviously be a bit longer because the student is saying more. This one begins with a nice point at the beginning um, and in that green section they are already analysing because they're, they're using comments like, the writer is making the exhibition seem highly impressive and magical, that's an effect. So the, right, the, um, the reader, the, the student, is already beginning to um, think about the effects. The evidence is much more effective, it's more concise for a start, and it's also embedded um, in yellow there. Um, but in blue, there could be, you know, striving to a higher mark, um, the ability to maybe use some terminology like phrase or um, you know nouns and adjectives and verbs and etc so perhaps that could be developed that would be the student's next target and again at the bottom the the student needs to give just a little bit more detail 
Again, there's a little bit of an abrupt end to this paragraph. Um, they attempt it, allowing them to vividly imagine the scene, but imagine what about the scene? There's that question that they could answer which develops it even further, allowing them to imagine what about the scene. Um, so they could talk about that. Finally, a high level answer, longer still, uh, and this is pretty much now coming towards you know perfection for this answer for Pearson 2.0. Again, we've got a clear and concise point at the beginning in yellow. The evidence in green is being used well, um, although I haven't highlighted there another quote, supernatural hands. Um, so that's also good. Um, but in blue, the most impressive thing about this is the detail in which they give their own um, comment on the effects or impacts. Uh, reinforces the fact that, that she felt the crowd were being controlled by some supernatural power. This would persuade readers to attend the exhibition because of the beauty of, of the inspiring artefacts on display. So clearly the student is more confident and in their comfort zone by debating language choice. They've also used the device noun phrase, which is great. Um, they could have also called ruled and subdued verbs, um, but they didn't. But again, this is an example of a high level or a higher level language response for Pearson 2.0. Okay, so hopefully that was useful for you. Um, obviously aimed at students doing the Pearson 2.0 specification, but there is a great degree of similarity across all exam boards regarding language analysis. It is the same essentially across all of them. So even if you're not doing two, uh, Pearson 2.0 as your course, um, this hopefully would be useful for the course that you are studying with your specific exam board. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. Of course, there are extensive videos in my language analysis playlist on my channel, so have a look at those. Um, but thank you very much for watching.